my lab, we aim to develop materials that do not exist yet, the materials of the future. But particularly, we're trying to do this from the nanoscale up. To illustrate this concept better, let's start with this idea. Let's say we have a slab of material in front of us, and this material is somewhat sturdy, so I cannot bend it easily, I cannot stretch it easily. The caveat that I'll tell you is that this material is 99% air. So then you have to ask the question, okay, so where is that 1% of material, right? It's a hard question to answer, and we know that the answer definitely is not to have it just in one corner. That is exactly the question we try to answer when we do research in architected materials. So let's look at it from a historical perspective. Humanity has been getting better and better at doing more with less material. If we look back a few millennia ago, these pyramids in Egypt, we see that they're beautiful structures, but there's not a lot of efficient use of material. Let's fast forward a couple of millennia, and now we start seeing these Roman aqueducts that start using this concept of arches, and now we can do way more with less material. And again, let's fast forward a couple of millennia, and this one of my favorite structures, the Eiffel Tower, really epitomizes what we can do with materials nowadays. This is what we're trying to do, but at the material length scale. So let me start by answering the question, what do we mean by architected materials? And nature really is the best place to start. For example, and I will say nature has a few million years of a head start compared to us. This example of sea sponges, which are an architected material, except they are hierarchical. And what I mean by hierarchical is that as you start zooming in at different length scales, you start picking out features and, and structural features that each serve a purpose and make these sponges quite robust. So we're trying to leverage that knowledge and try to make architected materials in our lab. So we want them to have some overall length scale W with some engineered microstructure or nanostructure at a length scale L that is significantly smaller than W. Okay, so that's architected materials. I bet you're asking yourselves, why do we bother with studying architected materials? And I'll try to highlight three aspects, which to me are most convincing. And this really is what drives the research that we do in our lab. First one, it's kind of obvious, and I already mentioned it. So if we have just 1% of solid in this material, they're extremely lightweight. And that's what we need if we want to keep sending probes to different planets. The second aspect, and this is very easy to understand if you think of it from a bike helmet perspective, the foams in these helmets is what really absorbs energy, but those are not engineered. Where we can engineer them and make much better energy absorbing materials. Now the third aspect, and this is where nano comes into play, nanoscale materials behave nothing like what we expect them to behave in bulk. An example of these are ceramics. If you have a coffee mug and you drop it, of course it's going to fail in a brittle manner. But we've seen that these ceramics at the nanoscale behave more like a rubber. So how do we make these materials? So this is one of the typical materials that we can make in our lab. This is a polymeric one. It's a 3D building block that we tessellate in all dimensions. Uh, we basically make it with a 3D printer. It's not a regular 3D printer. It's the highest 3D printer, uh, highest resolution 3D printer in the world. Uh, it's a process called two photomethography. It basically works by focusing a laser inside of a drop of a photoresist. And wherever you trace this laser, you're going to uh, solidify the material locally. And then we can make whatever 3D structure you really want. To give you a sense of scale, so this is what a human hair would look like next to the samples and materials that we can make in our lab. But I also said we make them out of ceramics. So this is how we would go about it. We take these polymeric structures. Now we coat them with very thin layers of a ceramic. Uh, and so thin, for example, that we can be talking about tens of nanometers, uh, which is just about a handful of DNA helices thick. So as you can imagine, we've been able to make, as a community in architected materials, a variety of different geometries of architected materials that achieve a lot of great properties. But there's a couple of bottlenecks that we are facing in our community. One is that they're all microscopic. They're all about the, the size of, of our human hair, and, and it's not going to uh, allow us to apply them broadly if, if we cannot scale them up. The second aspect is that we understand their properties, but we really have been looking at a slow deformation regime. It's very comparable to us just basically poking it with our finger. We, can, we want to understand these materials in more dynamic real-world conditions, such as how sound propagates through them and eventually how they might respond upon impact. So in my lab, there's two main directions that we're going in. First one is how are we going to scale up the fabrication of these materials? How can we take these nanoscale features but eventually give you a nanomaterial that you can hold in your hands? The second aspect is how are we going to characterize these materials across these dynamic regimes? How can we understand their properties upon impact and whatnot? So let me start off with the first example of how are we going to scale them up in the length scale perspective. 
So in that sense, we're now bypassing all sorts of 3D printing. Instead, we're leveraging polymeric emulsions that behave just like oil and water, two polymers that don't want to mix within each other. So they separate and they form these really nice microstructures. And the remarkable thing is that in a matter of hours, we now can make cubic centimeter volumes of these very nice microstructures. But polymers are not going to get us too far. So this is where we come in and coat them with interesting ceramics. Again, it's still at the nanoscale. But I want to make them lightweight. So we remove the polymer from the inside, and we end up with very nice interconnected curved shells uh, that are at the nanometer scale. So this is what these shells actually look like. They're nicely curved, nicely uh, organized and interconnected. The pore sizes are on the order of about 10 microns. That's a little red blood cell, just to give you a sense of scale. And again, these shells are just tens of nanometers in thickness. So what benefit does that give us? So this is one of the favorite experiments that we do in our lab. So we put these samples inside of a scanning electron microscope, and we can do mechanical compression and take a look while we're doing this. So this is ceramic. Uh, more than 99% of this is air. Uh, and the rest are these very, very thin, about 40 in a helix thick ceramic walls. So as we start compressing it, we see that these structures or these materials don't shatter in a brittle manner. This is a ceramic. Instead, they wrinkle, they buckle. When we remove the load, they actually recover. And we can keep doing this. Again, the second cycle, and we don't see any evidence of cracks propagating through these materials. So you can imagine if we can scale this up, to much larger length scales, this really changes the way we think about ceramics altogether. Now let me move into the more dynamic regime, how mechanical waves or sound propagate through these materials. So one of the examples that we've been working with is this. I mean, you can think of it as a, a square grid of an architecture material, and we want to study how sound propagates through it. So this material is nothing special. Every, every single frequency of, of sound in the megahertz regime is going to propagate through it. But what we, did, when, what we then, did then is to then apply some stimulus that then would reconfigure the microstructure of these materials. So they all buckle, and they form this structure that I'm showing now here in the bottom. What we saw is that some frequencies still propagate, as we would expect, but there was a subset of frequencies that will not propagate because of how we changed the structure. And then I'm going to show you a little example on, on the right. This is a video of this reconfiguration taking place. And what you start seeing is not only that everything's changing, but that we've been able to architect a couple of paths within this material. And that is important because that means that now we're able to selectively send a couple of frequencies down these paths and really reinvent the way sound propagates through these materials. And this is particularly at the megahertz regime where medical ultrasound could find a lot of applications. Now, the last little topic I'd like to mention is this idea of energy absorption and impact in these materials. So here we started, uh, you know, the motivation really was it's a common problem, uh, which is called micrometeoroid impact. So up in space, uh, there's a lot of space dust, tiny particles that fly at extremely high velocities. And even though they're small, they have so much kinetic energy that they will cause a lot of damage when they impact uh, very expensive spacecraft. This is just one example uh, from a tiny speck of paint that hit the space shuttle windshield and formed a huge, huge damage. So with that in mind, we want to use architecture materials, particularly at the nanoscale, to potentially make coatings that could prevent these type of damage to take place. So this is what some of our shields look like, these coatings. So these are nano-architected carbon materials. And since my, none of my students are astronauts just yet, no pressure, then we had to do this in our, on our lab in Earth. How can we do these tests? Well, there's a way to accelerate these tiny microparticles, which are glass microparticles. The sizes are about 14 microns, so very comparable to the red blood cells. And we can accelerate these at, at supersonic velocities. And not only that, we can also take a high-speed camera and really take a look at these impact events taking place. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you on the right-hand side. So you're going to see this particle come in from the top, hit our materials, form some crater, but in the end, these materials actually end up rejecting the projectile. In some cases, we also were able to find that these materials were good at capturing these projectiles, as you can see here. We could take a closer look, and indeed, you see that a lot of this energy dissipation came because we were able to crush the material under it. We are also able to do a quantitative analysis, and we were able to find that these materials are about 70% more effective at dissipating energy than typical Kevlar per unit mass. So with that, I hope that today I've convinced you that we really need to think about outside the box when we think of the materials of the future. 
And I also hope that you're convinced that thinking of ceramics that can be deformed and also recover is not a crazy idea. We know that we can design the right architecture, both at the, arc at the micro scale or at the nano scale, to make this possible. So I want to give a test to you all. Please help us think outside the box. Tell us what these ideal materials of the future should look like. And let me and my team know, and I promise you we'll work tirelessly to make sure that these become a reality. Thank you.